You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is Brian McClanahan, your host, and this is Episode 73, covering the week of May 22nd through May 26, 2017. Glad to have you back on the program. Glad to be here. Before we get started, just want to do the normal housekeeping. If you like this podcast, please share it around on social media. You can do so by liking our Facebook page at Abbeville Institute. You can follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute, and you can also like our YouTube page. So go on out there and do that. Also, you can go to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org, and sign up for our free email list. We'll send you the Daily Dose of Dixie Monday through Friday and also our weekly email on Sundays. And when you do that, you'll get a free copy of Kirkpatrick Sales' Emancipation Hell in ebook form. So go on out there and sign up for those things. It's a great way to keep in touch with us and for us to keep in touch with you. And also to look forward for our programs or to our programs. We have one coming up in the middle of July, our summer school. Very few slots open in that, maybe three or four. So if you're thinking about going to that summer school, uh, go ahead and contact Dr. Livingston now and get yourself a spot. It's not just a stuffy set of lectures. You have uh, great events going on. Also, you're going to get to meet the faculty at the Abbeville Institute, including yours truly, along with Dr. Livingston, Clyde Wilson, and others. So it's a great time. A lot of people say this is a yearly event they won't miss. Uh, if you are an undergraduate or a graduate student and you want to attend, we do have scholarships. Again, you might be able to get one of those last few slots. So uh, please uh, get in touch with Dr. Livingston as soon as possible so you can get on board for our summer school. This is the uh, 15th annual summer school. We've been doing this since 2002, so uh, it's a great time, well worth your time to uh, come down and visit us at the beach in South Carolina. Okay, so a lot of stuff going on this week, of course, in the news with the South. We had, at the end of last week, the final statue taken down in Louisiana. Uh, I was actually on a uh, the Tom Wood show talking about that uh, this past week. And, of course, now there was a movement to try to get the uh, statues taken out of Richmond, uh, there was some discussion about uh, uh, putting a plaque in Gainesville, Florida, contextualizing uh, history there, whatever that means. As I said in another piece, it's Yankee-fying history, but that's that's what the goal is. And I actually read an article this week about a museum in Georgia that's going to be forced to close its doors because it had to remove all its Confederate flags. It's a Civil War museum, quote-unquote, and it took out the Confederate flags. So this shows you how far this thing is going to go, and um, as I mentioned in the piece that I wrote, you know the, these symbols are the low-hanging fruit, and of course they're going to be under attack. But then, where do you stop? Once you stop, once you uh, take down all these Southern symbols, you're going to go after the founding generation. Andrew Jackson's now on the uh, chopping block there in Louisiana. So, where do you stop? Now, uh, one thing that I think is um, is interesting about that museum case is that it's often said, well, this flag should be in a museum. We should put the thing in a museum, and uh, that's the proper place for the flag and for statues uh, in honoring the Confederacy. Well, here we had a museum where the thing was removed. So uh, obviously museums aren't even enough. You have to go out for, for political, politically correct reasons and remove flags from museums now. Uh, there was actually a museum in Florida that uh, they had to remove the flag because they had a, a wax museum with an exhibit of uh, presidents, American presidents. And, of course, they had one for Jefferson Davis. He was an American president. And they had a battle flag behind Jefferson Davis. No one had a problem with this except for some news media jerk who decided to go in there and uh, make a big stink out of, out of it. So they took the flag down there. I mean, this just shows you what uh, is going on in the American psyche on the left. It's, it's a purging. It's a, it's a cultural Marxist purging of anything they don't like. In fact, I would suggest that these people want United States history to start about 1975. Uh, if they could get away with that and write all hi all history textbooks as starting in 1975, they would do that because uh, you could make a case that around the mid 70s is when Reconstruction was completely finished in some ways uh, throughout the United States. Of course, I could I could make a case that it's still ongoing, but when you've had uh, in the South uh, Wall Street become more important than Main Street. Uh, the stock price become more important than the cotton price, which is what's happened. You know, banking and insurance have taken over in southern cities. Most people are not interested in farming or uh, crop prices anymore. You still have a large number of farmers, but not as many as you used to. Though I would say that we're going to talk about a couple of these issues in this week. 
uh, you're starting to see more and more of these organic farmers or green farmers, you know, the local family farm. People are getting a lot more interested in this, not just in California where it's become trendy, but in the South as well. Uh, and so you have these family farms that are becoming important or essential. You have a lot more Southerners who are uh, taking a look at putting a garden in their backyard, at getting back to their roots. And so I think that this is all going to go in stages. Of course, one of the main things we look at with the Southern tradition is the agrarian tradition. And the 12 Southerners who read I'll Take My Stand and the critique that they gave of modern capitalism. And fortunately, we actually have, uh, when our book reviews, uh, our, our Abbeville Review of Books, starts in earnest in July. One of the first reviews we're going to run, in fact, the first review we're going to run, uh, is on John uh, Crow Ransom's Land, which um, is the economic treatise that everyone, everyone always wanted to see. You know, One of the common critiques of I'll Take My Stand is that these guys didn't know economics. So Ransom wrote this book, Land, which was an unpublished manuscript for years, and University of Notre Dame Press finally published it this year. And so we have a book review of that, and you're going to want to go out and get it. Uh, just for, if nothing else, if you're curious about what the agrarians said about economics, um, it would be a great book to read. So that's, uh, that's something that's coming up in a few weeks. But there's a lot of stuff to get to before that. Of course, June, we start getting some very important birthdays. Next week on Monday, we have Patrick Henry's birthday, among others. But there are some, uh, some great events coming up or some, some great uh, anniversaries coming up, so to speak. Uh, for uh, the South. But for this week, some of the themes I just mentioned are important for this week as well. So the first piece we ran was by Paul Yarbrough, and uh, Mr. Yarbrough has done a great job for us. Uh, He's published a number of really interesting pieces, and I think this one fits the bill. It's entitled Home, and it's it's a philosophical piece. And in fact, he brings up one of our Abbeville scholars, Dr. James Kibler, who will actually be one of the uh, faculty at the summer school this year. And uh, Jim Kibler is a great author. He was a professor of English at the University of Georgia, and uh, he's written a number of wonderful books. Um, One of those is Our Father's Fields, which I'm actually going to tie into another review of of another book and put the two together and and compare and contrast in a way uh, later on. But um, what what Paul does a great job here is is talking about what's important about the South. And so we talk about the Southern tradition, we talk about the Southern political tradition, and of course, you know, that's something that people often focus on, whether it's decentralization, federalism, secession, nullification, take your pick. But a lot of people don't understand the cultural part of that. You can't have federalism, you can't have nullification, you can't have secession unless you have something to defend. And when Southerners decided to secede in 1860 and 61, they just went home. They had something to defend. Most of these people were farmers. They were already independent people. Uh, And as the piece at the end of the week shows, they weren't poor. So they had something to defend. They had something tangible. It was the land. It was their home. These are things that were being invaded. These were things they thought were in danger, were in jeopardy by staying in the Union. And so one thing that we look at today in American society is that we are a debtor nation, not just uh, from the central government, but also among the people of America, North and South. Southerners have been tied as much into this uh, northern economy, this Hamiltonian system, as anyone else, and that's because of Reconstruction. Reconstruction was also economic as much as it was political and social. So you've had that, that happen But we need to understand what this home means, what that soil means, putting your feet in the dirt, grounding yourself somewhere. And uh, Mr. Yarborough does such a good job in explaining, you know, his home is Mississippi. His wife's home was Louisiana. And uh, his wife died, and he buried her back in Louisiana. And so they're going to be buried together. And he feels most at home down dirt roads. There's a wonderful line, you know. um, He says, dirt roads take you home, interstate highways take you to traffic jams. Uh, interstate highways, he says, take away land which was which were places for homes once and fields of cotton and corn. Now fields grow corn for ethanol, for cars, so more freeways will be needed to take away more fields for corn. What? Yeah, that's what he says. Um, he says, it's often been acknowledged that the North was and still is the Navigation Society, the South, the Agrarian Society. And in some ways that's still true. 
though again, it depends on where you are in the South and how much Reconstruction has taken hold of the economy. But that's something that we often think about the South. It's the rural South. Uh, it's, it's why the South is solid, because it, it's, it's more than just uh, a political disposition. It's a cultural disposition, tying to the land, tying to the soil, tying to a place. As I've said on this podcast before, Southerners sing about Sweet Home Alabama. No one sings about Sweet Home uh, Boston. Uh, they just don't do it. Uh, you know, there is New York, New York, and New York City actually had a, a, a tangible attachment to it for, for many Northerners and for, for a lot of reasons. So a lot of people were proud of being from New York, and in that way, you know, you can look at Donald Trump and as a New Yorker and other things, and, and Southerners can kind of associate with that. But it's very hard to find people in the North who really sing about where they're from. But in the South, you find it all the time. People sing about where they're from. They love the place, the people. And I think that's something that sets the Southern tradition apart from almost anything else in America. Uh, and it's something that... Um, a lot of people, when they, when they come to the United States and they're not from the United States, they find in the South. They don't find it in other places. The South was not cosmopolitan. And, of course, uh, Richard Weaver, and this is something we're going to talk about at the summer school, often, in a very famous essay, he compared and contrasted Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, uh, both 18th century liberals in, in many ways, but one was a liberal in Virginia and one was a liberal of the world. Franklin being the cosmopolitan, the man of the world. Jefferson being the man of Virginia, who's eye level with his mountains. Who could reform Virginia, but that's as far as it went. That's why Jefferson was so interested in federalism, because he didn't want New Englanders deciding what they would do in Virginia. And I think that's an important part of what makes the Southern tradition so vital to the American, uh, American experience. Because it was that idea of, you know, leave us alone. And even, as Flannery O'Connor said, you know, we can, we can recognize in the South oddities. Uh, but oftentimes those oddities are accepted in the South. It's kind of like, yeah, okay, well, that guy does that there. We're just going to leave him alone. Yeah, they're strange. We're going to call them out as being strange. These aren't, you know, these are kind of weird people. But, now nah, they're just part of the community too. Whereas... Uh, you didn't find that as much. I mean, it, in, in Massachusetts, they're, they're running people out of town for being odd. They're, uh, you know, they're, they're slapping them with, with um, the scarlet letter, as uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne pointed out. You know, but you look at Puritan culture and what that was like. I mean, this was, this was a horrible, harsh culture. You just didn't have that as much in the South. So even though they recognized that there was odd, they tolerated it more. Uh, I think that's something that people don't it's, it's the It's the idea that the South is intolerant. When they come down here, they find it's very tolerant. It's a very tolerant place. They don't think that. I mean, people uh, have said they, they, you know, and they're from the North and they get into the South, <gasps> they get to Atlanta and they think there's just, they have this intense fear about what they're going to run into. And of course, Atlanta is not really much of the South anymore. But they think they get into the South, there's this intense fear of what they're just going to find people are going to hate them. Who they are, and what they find is that people are always very nice to them. Oh yeah, you're you're a Yankee boy, but okay, <laughs> that's fine. Just don't bother us, and we won't bother you. Uh, you know, we're not stirring up trouble. Don't come down here and stir up trouble. And I think that's often been the perception of Northerners. They just want to stir up trouble in the South. And so, uh, next couple of weeks, I'm going to run a piece about that um, entitled. Yankees being Yankees, and it's on a contemporary thing that's going on. But uh, I think that's the important part of this. You know, that that idea of home, that has to be first and foremost paramount in order for any of these political ideas to actually take root. You have to be defending something. Otherwise, there's we're just talking about, well, we want to have low taxes. Okay. Uh, there's nothing really there to defend. There has to be something tangible that you want to protect. On Tuesday, we ran a piece uh, by uh, Christina Jeffrey, and she was for about a week the House historian, and she was actually uh, given that position by Newt Gingrich, who she knew well because she's uh, she worked with Gingrich in Georgia 
and uh, her uh, husband is uh, uh, a professor of government at Wofford College in South Carolina. But uh, she knew um, she knew Gingrich, and she was given this position as House historian. But then, but then, lo and behold, the attacks come because she had denied a uh, middle school presentation on the Holocaust, actually given it the highest marks of the committee that rejected the, the proposal because they didn't want middle schoolers acting like Nazis. That was the reason. But the left ran this as, uh, you know, she was an anti-Semitic person. There was no evidence of that. In fact, they admitted it. Chuck Schumer admitted that. Oh, yeah. But the thing about this piece is very interesting is that she received no support from the Republican Party that she expected to receive. The Democrats attacked her, the left attacked her, and no one took no one took to her defense. Well, that's because the Republican Party is the stupid party. We're seeing it now with the Trump administration, the establishment. Uh, these people don't really stand for anything. They're great when they can sit out there and raise money on being in opposition, but they don't know what to do when they have any power because they don't really believe what they're saying. It's a way to gain power. And once they have power, they don't really even care if they have it. In fact, it was often remarked that Republicans, particularly when the Democrats dominated the government for decades, the Republicans were fine not having any power. They were fine just being able to play golf and go up there and uh, you know, give lip service to, to an opposition. They didn't really want to have any of this stuff. And so the American people have decided that they want the, the principles, theoretically, that back the, Demo- the uh, Republican Party, which none of these people believe in. That's what they want to see happen, which is why Trump won the election. But yet when these people get in power, they don't actually believe this stuff. So Americans are finding out about the stupid party. It's always been the stupid party. It's always been the party of nothing. Uh, And it's always been anti-South. Even though the Republicans are now the dominant party of the South, it's never really been a Southern party, ever. Uh, And her conclusion, of course, is that you can't be a Southerner in the government and not be attacked. Nobody's going to come to your defense. Look what's happening with Trump now. Now he's not a Southerner, but of course the South helped him get into power. And so the media can't stand it that they lost. The media lost is who lost in 2016. The media lost. And they can't stand it. So they've taken their whole time to try to tear down the Trump administration without any any uh, evidence or backing or anything. I mean, these are just this is just a, a crusade now. And the same thing happened here when uh, Miss, uh, actually Dr. Jeffrey, was uh, given this position as House historian. She was torn down, shown on CNN as some type of anti-Semite, which wasn't true, and no one's, no one came to her defense. In fact, the establishment piled on, actually sided with the left. Now, where does that sound familiar? So this is a situation that Southerners have to be aware of, that no matter what we do, if you look at the flag situation, the monument situation, the establishment right is piling on with the left. Well, of course, because that's really what they believe in. They don't really believe in uh, that, that that flag or these Confederate symbols mean the Jeffersonian America, the Jeffersonian experience. To them, people like Karl Rove, the South was the enemy. They actually come out and say that. Uh, Rove was reviewing, uh, when, I, when I wrote the, uh, the piece, The Hard Hand of War, which I talked about in this podcast, and uh, he was reviewing the book about um, North Alabama, the war in North Alabama, which was entitled War's Desolating Scourge, the Union Occup- Union's Occupation of North Alabama uh, by Joseph Danielson. Uh, so when he reviewed this thing on his, on his website, he called the Confederacy the enemy. This is really how they think, you know, because they weren't Republicans. And if you look at the cartoonish history of America now, you know, the Democrats are the bad guys. There was just something that, uh, you know, this Prager University, you know, of course, Prager is a Republican, and uh, his very cartoonish image of what America, you know, the Democrats are the ones that did this, the Democrats are the ones that broke apart the, all this other kind of stuff. So in that, in that Republican line, then, of course, the South can't be anything but the enemy. And you find that Southerners aren't really the allies of the Republican Party. They're used. They're a usable piece to gain elections, to gain, to gain victory in elections, but really, Republicans don't really believe in what Southerners want. Now, maybe some Southern Republicans do, but again, 
they're they're kind of persona non grata among the establishment. And to hammer this point home, we had a piece on Wednesday by Philip Lee, Radical Republican Selective Racial Equality. So again, you often hear this thing. Now, of course, Philip Lee has come out with a, with a very interesting book entitled Southern Reconstruction. And uh, go out there and pick it up. You can. It's uh, linked on the piece itself. Uh, but he points out that really what the Republican Party wanted in the 1860s was votes. This is a way to win elections. If they could get the black vote in the South, they would win. That was the important thing. So it's important to note that this dedication to quote-unquote racial equality was really political, nothing more. It wasn't anything, uh, it wasn't for you know, moralistic reasons or because they really firmly believed that uh, white Americans and black Americans were equal. In fact, I've written a piece you know, on that fact, all the things that the Republicans said over and over again that showed they really didn't believe in that principle at all. And of course, he points out also that Republicans were um, selective in this in that they attacked Chinese. You know, the Chinese immigrants who were coming to America were not protected by Republican racial equality. Uh, neither were, for that matter, American Indians who were rounded up and put into to essentially concentration camps. We call those reservations. But that's what they were. Uh, so this, this dedication to equality only went as far as gaining votes. When Chinese didn't matter or when American Indians didn't matter, well, then it doesn't matter. If they can't vote, you can't vote you in office. Well, who cares? So we're going to support uh, black Southerners having the suffrage. Uh, we're going to support them because that means we can win elections. So they weren't really that dedicated to the entire idea that um, the uh, the uh, the plight of former slaves in the South. I mean, it was all about votes. Now, of course, this is a very unpopular thing to say nowadays because supposedly this has been disproven. It really hasn't. It's just not trendy. It's just not popular. And so Lee is taking a great risk and putting a book out that basically says this. And this piece covers that nicely. So go on out there and check that out. It's, it's a very interesting piece. Also, um, you know, buy his book if you can. We're going we're gonna to review it. But um, in that regard, you know, we have uh, the piece on Thursday uh, by Alana Mercer, who is a uh, well-known, uh, she calls herself a paleo-libertarian uh, and writes a weekly column uh, also, um, but this piece was published at townhall.com. It's entitled Sanctuary City Mayor Trashes an American Hero, Robert E. Lee. And so she ties in the fact that Lee, in fact, was a an American hero, not just a Southern hero, and that uh, to attack him is very much un-American. Uh, that uh, she says, Lee, you see, was, the, was first and foremost a Virginian, the state that gave America its greatest presidents and the Constitution itself, and this is true. Um, and so she points out that, you know, Lee was the personification of what it meant to be an American. Nothing else, nothing less, and certainly you can't get anything more than that. Um, and so we take down Robert E. Lee at our peril. We take down Robert E. Lee, and we take down part of America. Everyone recognized when these statues were put up, which were done, uh, and on, on my podcast, if you want to subscribe to that, it's the Brian McClanahan Show. But the last episode I did was on Memorial Day, and I'm going to write a piece for it uh, next week uh, that will be published on Monday for the Abbeville Institute. But um, these statues were put up as recognition of reconciliation. These were put up, as, as Kerry Roberts said at one of our conferences, with pennies. People were, were donating pennies to put these things up to remember their loved ones who had died in a war. And Union veterans, the ones who would probably be most offended by any of this, would reach across the statue and shake hands with these Confederate veterans in a spirit of reconciliation and say, you know what, Robert E. Lee was a great American. You were a great American. You were fighting for something you believed in. We were fighting for something we believed in. Let's let bygones be bygones. You have your statues and your images and your songs and your people, your history, we have ours, but it's okay because we still are a union. And Southerners wanted to be part of that. That reconciliation is gone. Maybe never to come back. I'd like not to think so. But that's the situation we're running into in 2016 as, 
as Clyde once told me, Clyde Wilson said, you know, well, Yankees get a little obnoxious and aggressive about every 50 years. And this is true. Uh, it's been about 50 years since the 1960s. It's 1860s, they were obnoxious and aggressive. They were obnoxious and aggressive in the 18-teens. Again, in the 19-teens. So about every 50 years, they get a little rambunctious. And every time they do it, they chip away a little more at traditional America, at real America, Jeffersonian America. So um, here we have a situation where you know Lee should be recognized. And unfortunately, again, the Republican establishment doesn't want anything to do with Confederate statues or American heroes like Robert E. Lee. They're as much behind taking these things down as the North is, as these uh, leftist radicals, these Marxists who want to take these things down, even Andrew Jackson. I mean, why, why, you know, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, why stop with the Confederates? And they're, they're going to go after these. And I think eventually they're going to overplay their hand, but we'll see. I mean, I hope Americans would finally stand up and say, you know, okay, we could, we could see maybe the low-hanging fruit there. Maybe that offended somebody, even though it shouldn't. Maybe it did. Uh, but now we have to draw a line somewhere. So we'll see. Uh, it's not a slippery slope uh, fallacy because I think we can see it's actually happening. Um, so, oh, you know, stay tuned. Now, one thing that I mentioned as I started this podcast was the idea of the South being poor after the war uh, and was it poor before the war. The, the answer is unequivocally no. In fact, the South was the wealthiest section in the United States. In fact, uh, there were very few states that, even, that could even match it, even when you count slaves as potential wealth holders, when you use per capita statistics. And so not just that, there were not just the, the rich planters who are often, I mean, look, there was a lot of money in the South before the war, particularly in the 1850s in places like Louisiana with sugar plantations. These places, these people were filthy, stinking rich. Uh, but not just that. When you look at the average Southerner, uh, the middling landowners, what are often called the yeoman landowners and these type, type of people, they actually had more money than your typical Northerner, who was a farmer as well, or your Midwesterner, who was a farmer. Uh, and these people weren't even slaveholders. So you look at uh, the, the amount of money that was in the South before the war, and this piece was written by Bill Cawthon in 1982 under the direction of Emory Thomas. And uh, it's an amazing piece. It's very scholarly. It's done well. And he has all these great little charts that show exactly how much uh, the South was worth, Southerners were worth before the war. Uh, and how they compared to the rest of the United States. And when you put some of these charts in here at the, uh, in, at the, in the appendix, which are now image files on this particular piece, when you look at them, you know, we look at wealth per capita by state, you see that the, of the 35 states in the United States in 1860, the poorest was Kansas. And when you look at the bottom group, well, th this is by per capita if you count, uh, if you don't count, um, slaves as wealth holders. So you count them as, you know, you take them out. But Mississippi, South Carolina, Louisiana, Alabama, Virginia, Georgia, Texas, Florida, Tennessee, North Carolina, Kentucky, and Arkansas were the top 12. The first northern state to crack the list is Connecticut at number 13. Now, when you put in slaves as potential wealth holders, now these, this would mean that slaves are now counted in, and you divide up the per capita, including slaves. Mississippi is still number one. Louisiana is number two, South Carolina is number three, Alabama is number four, Connecticut comes in at number five at that point. But then still, Tennessee, Texas, and Virginia are six, seven, and eight. You've got New Jersey, nine, Oregon, ten, Delaware is number 11, Georgia, uh, I'm sorry, Kentucky is 12, Georgia, 13, Massachusetts, 14, Maryland, 15. Kansas is still last. I mean, none of these southern states, North Carolina got booted down pretty far down the list at 23rd. Uh, but for the most part, you saw uh, these states the southern states as being very wealthy. And this is an important point to make because oftentimes, you know, when, when people go out and say, well, the South paid 80% of tariffs. Now, realistically, you can't say that. Uh, but as we ran a piece by Philip Lee again uh, a couple of weeks ago on this particular issue, he actually had the right answer to this. It's not about who paid the tariff. It's about the fact that the South was exporting a tremendous amount of cash crops. The North would lose that balance of trade. And, of course, the South being a free trade area, which, of course, 
they had uh, in order to entice foreign investment in the South. Actually, the Foreign Relations Committee, which was headed up by, I believe, Robert Barnwell Rett, uh, came up with a proposal that played up this free trade element of the South. And if that had happened, trade in the North would have been destroyed. Their, their economy would have been destroyed if there had not been an, a blockade and if the South had been able to break that blockade. Even New York, wealthy New York, and of course one of these uh, nobodies online that likes, oh, I mean, he thinks he's very smart. I'm going to show this book and how much revenue went into New York. Okay, great. New York, yes, was a major trading center. Most of the revenue, most of the most of the trade went through New York in the United States. We I mean, did have major trading centers in the South, too, and you had one in Philadelphia. Most of the trade went through New York. True. This is why New York wanted to secede when the South seceded. There were people in New York City that said, I want out. Because New York was making a lot of money on the South. They're not there. They don't make as much money. And then he breaks it down by counties and how the counties in the South, when you look at counties, there were so many counties in the South that were wealthy, not just you know very wealthy, but also that kind of middling wealthy, and more of those than what you found in northern states. So the South was actually very wealthy, even outside of the large planters. Uh, you had very wealthy counties, very wealthy individuals, both uh, those who were large planters and people who were not large planters. And so the idea that somehow uh, the South was poor, it was poor after the war, and that's because Reconstruction destroyed the South. The war destroyed the South, destroyed the Southern economy. And it was more than just uh, eradicating the institution of slavery, of course, and uh, the large planters didn't have any money. The common farmers in the South were also put uh, into poverty by the war. And in fact, the Kennedy brothers have a great book, Punished by Poverty. It's uh, uh, through Shotwell Press, uh, and they talk about this. You know, poverty became the South because the war destroyed the Southern economy. The South was a very wealthy section before the war, both uh, across the spectrum. And when the war was over, now it wasn't anymore. So put this piece together with uh, Philip Lee's piece on, a uh, very brief piece on economics. And he, and he does, uh, he had a book entitled Trading with the Enemy, where he talks about economics uh, and he, he likes economic history, and so I think you should check out his other books as well. Um, he's a very even-handed historian. Um, he, he, he's not really pro-South or pro-North. He just tells a story, which is what historians should do anyways. Uh, and so uh, he does a very good job of pointing out, you know, they can't answer the question, why did, this, why did the North decide to go to war? I mean, that's, that's the question that needs to be asked, not necessarily why the South seceded, uh, but why the North chose war? That's always the question. And that's the one that really destroys this self-righteous Yankee imperialism that we see uh, about the war. When you actually ask that question, their entire house of cards comes crumbling down. So we had a lot of great material this week on the website. We're going to have great material next week. If you do like what we do here, again, you can donate to the Abbeville Institute. We do exist on your tax-deductible contributions alone for as little as 5 bucks a month. You can help us in our mission uh, to explore what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition. So it's well worth your, uh, hopefully well worth your hard-earned Yankee greenbacks to give us a little bit of money, keep this podcast going, keep the website going, keep those things uh, out there because this is how we help turn the tide, hopefully, in the future by providing educational materials for people uh, in the South and, and, and in the world. We have people that read our website all over the world, uh, all over the United States, and, of course, same thing with this podcast. Okay, until next time, good day. Good day.